Good morning and warmly welcome to the second Uppsala University Lecture in Climate Change Leadership. My name is Isak Stoddard and I'm part of the coordination team of the visiting Zundström Professorship here at Uppsala University. I'd like to start by inviting Vice Chancellor Eva Åkesson up to the podium to give a welcoming speech to both you in the room, those of you watching this from the Earth Science Library, and those of you watching this online, wherever you may be. Eva. Thank you. Is the mic on? Yes. Yes, thank you. Sometimes, sometimes time goes too quickly. In the case of climate change, this could not be more true. Though a lot is being done, we all know time is of essence. Last year, I made a welcoming speech to Professor Doreen Stabinsky. Time really flies. It was not long ago. And I welcomed you here to Uppsala University. And also, I thank the Foundation Sandstorm Philanthropist as they, as you, had made it possible for us to establish this professorship at our university. Our gratitude to the foundation still stands, of course. We need you, and we need your support. You make it possible for us to raise our level and invite the best researchers in the world to help us to contribute to the essential work against climate change. Together, we can make the world a better place. Another effort to well make the world better was uh, made at the uh, Climate Summit in Paris. It led to an understanding that we all made to take action and change the way we live as to, to stop making the climate worse. Nations of the world agreed and committed themselves to act. Every, but everyone claimed to grasp the fact that the world needs to heed the findings and knowledge researchers are providing and to deal with the consequences. Our students will play and are already playing a significant part of this work, in this work. S students are not only the leaders of tomorrow. They must step into the leadership roles right now. Lead us towards the world they want to live in and their children and grandchildren. Together with other institutions around the world, Uppsala University has an obligation to do what we can to make humanity change the course in the way we use the resources available to us. I and many others had therefore been happy to see all the initiatives that you, Professor Stabinsky, have taken. You have set a challenging and an important lead to follow. During the past years, you have certainly been busy here, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for what you have done and what you have achieved. I would especially want to mention the initiatives that you have taken to bring the students to Paris during the meet climate meeting and also to other key, cli uh, key climate meetings. I'm also very impressed by your work together with CMOS in expanding the opportunities for students to study and become active agents of change towards more climate-friendly future. Not the least within the two new courses offered this fall, a full-time course, Climate Change Leadership in Practice, and a new massive open online course, a MOOC, on climate change leadership. And now, a colleague of yours, Professor Kevin Anderson, will pick up the mantle. The expression is fitting, I think. A mantle or a cape is what superheroes wear, and in that sense is what we need now, superheroic efforts. But don't misunderstand me in saying that. I'm not saying that 
that we do expect you to breathe in all the pollution or to filter the oceans clean within a nanosecond or as a femtochemist in a femtosecond. I don't expect you to be that kind of hero, but I hope you are that kind that can inspire others to be creative and think new ideas in the face of this massive challenge, and in particular to inspire our students. From what I read and heard about you, I am convinced that you can find the right partners for cooperation and that you will help us on our way of making a change of perspective to happen. Once again, thank you for Sandstrom Philanthropists. Thank you, Professor Stavinsky, and welcome to Professor Kevin Anderson, and the best of luck to all of us in this. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Eva Okeson, Vice Chancellor. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Mr. Niklas Sandström up to the podium. Um, Niklas is an IT entrepreneur who used to study at Uppsala University and this year became Uppsala University's Alumni of the Year. So uh, please welcome Niklas Sandström. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me. So good morning and um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak to here today. It's, it's really exciting to be back in Uppsala. I started studying here almost 30 years ago um, on an early or late August day like today. It, it brings back good, good memories. And like most students, I was very eager to come here to, to learn and to get introduced to science. And I was never disappointed studying in Uppsala. It was very much a humbling experience. It was also personally very transformative in my life. Um, I got introduced to the complex worlds of science, to mathematics, physics, computer science, and I met a lot of other very, uh, people who were very hungry for knowledge. It was also a time over years when I decided um, at some point to become an entrepreneur, although back then we didn't know with the world for entrepreneur, but I thought I wanted to start a business using all the things I learned here in Uppsala. So today I remain very privileged to be standing here in front of you. And this university is a very special place full of very special people in search of knowledge. So I'd like to thank Doreen for spending the last year here and um, uh, helping to enlighten all the students here. I'd also like to welcome Kevin and wish him every success in his tenure. We owe Doreen and Kevin and other leaders in this field a great debt for their continued commitment to their research. Climate change is the biggest problem we're facing in our lifetime. Therefore, it was a natural decision for me to engage and support the university in this professorship position. And I'm glad that we've been able to attract world-leading scientists here. This is research that we all agree is critical for our future. Everyone here knows that our planet is being destroyed at an accelerated pace. And it's thanks to their work we are, we are the first generation who understands the problem and that we have to act. If we don't, we're facing catastrophic challenges for the world. Open up any newspaper, make a small talk at any party, the topic will come up. Denial is now a fringe position. Today there's no longer a debate whether climate change is man-made or not. A recent Pew study shows that most people acknowledge that climate change is a serious problem. This is progress, but it's not nearly enough. I, for one, refuse to be part of a generation who understands the problem but fails to act. We have a moral obligation to do what we can to change this trend. 
we're consuming 150% of the world's resources. And that's not surprising since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've been taught that consuming more and more of the resources equates to economic growth and somehow increased happiness. I don't accept this. In fact, I think we reached an age where the opposite is becoming true. We're just in front of a massive paradigm shift, the first of its kind since the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago. I'm not a world-leading expert on, uh, on climate change like Doreen and Kevin. I think about sustainability much more like an entrepreneur. If there's a problem, there's an opportunity. And I believe that environmental sustainability and economical sustainability go hand in hand. The stage is set for entrepreneurs and investors like myself to do more um, and to help leaders, academical leaders, to make some of their findings actionable. And there are two main reasons for this. First, the way consumers think about from who and where to get their products is changing. According to the most recent Nielsen uh, Global Sustainability Report, 66% of consumers say that they are willing to pay more for products uh, produced in a sustainable, from sustainable brands. This is up from 55% in 2014 and 50% in 2013. The figure for millennials is 75%, which is astonishing given the difficult uh, economical uh, situations for this generation. Sustainability is good for business as well. In 2015, sales for consumer goods from brands who demonstrated commitment to sustainability grew by more than 4%. Brands without these priorities grow less than 1%. So putting environmental impact at the center of business makes commercial sense. To many, building businesses for the very long term value rather than short term profit, which sounds like madness and bad business. But many of the tech entrepreneurs that I meet today, they recognize that sustainability is something that needs to be, be built in directly into the business model. And more importantly, they see big opportunities and challenges that they can solve. They see disruptive business opportunities. The second reason is that uh, for innovators, entrepreneurs, and investors, will help to create a sustainable future is the advancement of technology. History has taught us that we cannot sit back and wait for government or incumbent industry to make things happen. There's contrarian entrepreneurs who will create change. Entirely new disruptive solutions based on deep technologies such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and other technologies means that the way we are tackling climate change and, and environmental challenges are rapidly expanding. Opportunities will also come from the shift of how scientists are collaborating with each other. The boundaries between different scientific disciplines such as computer science with other scientists are slowly being broken down. At Uppsala here today, there are opportunities for scientists from different disciplines to collaborate. And this is a big opportunity with so, 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 such a vast university with this, so many different disciplines. And the possibilities of this frontier is endless. Scientists can mix and match from knowledge and experience and know-how from different departments. Entrepreneurs and innovators will use some of these findings and approaches to, to meet demands from these millennials who are demanding services to produce in a sustainable way. We're already seeing amazing companies practicing this. Tesla is probably the best example in the world today. Elon Musk has done much more 
than any government, any lobby group, or any incumbent to make a change in the car industry in their uh, transition to electrical vehicles. Entrepreneurs here in Sweden are doing an amazing job as well. I'm particularly impressed by Medrad Madubi, who founded Orbital Systems as an extension, extension of his thesis exam at Lunds University. Through the Green Mentorship Award, I supported him in his work to applying space technology from NASA that was developed in, uh, in conjunction with Lunds University to produce showers which are re recycling water, thereby you, uh, saving a scarce resource. I've also been supporting Clean Motion in Gothenburg, the company developing electrical tuk tucks with, with a potential to replace all these toe strokes tuk tucks in, in Southeast Asia. And crucially, all of these examples of businesses, and many of them, are economically as well as environmentally sustainable. And if this scale, they will have a huge environmental impact. Technological innovation is on an exponential growth curve. We will soon reach an inflection point where Sustainable alternatives are more economical than fossil solutions. And investors are now starting to understand this as well. Previous generations of business leaders and entrepreneurs were taught to maximize profit within the boundaries of the law. As long as you stayed within the law, your job was to maximize profit. It was the lawmaker's job to make sure whatever the environmental laws were. That's what I was taught when I was learning corporate finance here in Uppsala. But of course, that was back in the dark ages. Today, we're no longer living in a world of two extremes. Innovators, investors, and consumers no longer have to choose between profit and doing good. Profit is still important, but founders need to take the very long-term view as well. It is my strong conviction that companies focusing on the short-term profit optimization, they will lose out the long-term profit opportunities to companies focusing on genuinely sustainable businesses. Today, we are facing huge challenges in energy production, energy consumption, water, waste management, transportation, farming, of course, climate and a lot of other sustainability problems. These challenges will be overcome by innovators and entrepreneurs who are building profitable, sustainable businesses for the long term. At my investment firm, Atomico, we are focusing more than ever on finding and investing in such companies which have sustainability at their core. One of our earliest investments was a company called the Climate Corporation. Through its technology, using big data from weather stations, applying predictive learning, machine learning, they could develop a real-time solution to provide insurance to farmers for their crop, weather insurance for crop. And it turned out that uh, adverse weather is a source for 90% of, of lost crop. Not only did this company help farmers to become sustainable, they created a billion dollar exit for its founders and investors. More recently, we've invested in a company in the UK called FarmDrop. This company allows small scale local food producers to deliver their sustainable organic food directly to uh, consumers. And through the FarmDrop service, producers can increase their revenue while the consumers are getting food which is five times fresher than the supermarket and it's being delivered directly to the kitchen table. And we will see this type of innovations and new type of companies emerge in all sectors. As in one of the big opportunities, I'm ex specifically excited about aviation, which I predict will be one of the next big frontiers. Air travel and shipping are currently making up 5% of the global greenhouse gases. By 2050, 
if we don't have any disruptive changes with increased amount of travel that people are doing, this could raise to 30%. So this is just one example where an industry is ripe for disruptive innovation by bold entrepreneurs. So in summary, our future, our planet's future depends on the current generation of innovators, academics, and entrepreneurs. If we don't change, we will all experience an ecosystem collapse. The research of scientists like Doreen and Kevin is critical to accelerating the development of solutions that can help to save our planet. You are raising the awareness of the challenges we face and have brought about the generation of consumers who demand sustainable businesses and are willing to pay for it. It is my belief that those solutions will be developed by the next generation of entrepreneurs employing amazing new technology with an ambition to build the next great company. As an investor, I can tell you that that doesn't mean that we're not looking for profitable businesses, but I can promise you that today we're looking for businesses which are long-term sustainable. So you do no longer have to choose between making good and, and making money. It all goes back uh, hand in hand. Of course, I'm always impressed by any founder with a great vision who, about a great new product. But face it, we don't need any more dating apps or messaging apps. We have enough of them. So I appeal to everyone here today, when you're considering to what to do next after Uppsala, remember the unique circumstances which we're living in. We're living in a paradigm shift. You can save the world. Don't waste that opportunity. If you want to build a company, Build a company which is sustainable. If you're technically minded, think about how you can solve some of these big challenges and big problems we have in front of us using technology. And the combination of different sciences between computer science, geoscience, climate science, medicine, microbiology, and of course a lot of other sciences creates opportunities in an unprecedented scale. Use your talent, your education, and the experience that you're gaining to fix the world. You have the opportunity to help people to make change happen. Take that opportunity. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to welcome our first Zenstrom visiting professor, uh, Doreen Stavinsky, to um, give a few remarks uh, and then also introduce our second Zenstrom visiting professor, Kevin Anderson, to give his lecture. Welcome, Doreen. Thank you, Isak, and uh, thank you all. And well, as it's the end of my tenure here, I wanted to start with a very warm set of thank yous to a number of people. Um, thank you to Vice Chancellor Okasan for your leadership and your support to help get this new initiative off the ground. Thank you to the Geo Department and to Veo in particular as, as prefect for providing me with a, a comfortable academic home. Thank you to the staff and to all those others in the CMAS and CSD community, and you know who you are, but most notably Isak for your unparalleled collegiality and, and an ever-inspiring work environment. It's been really wonderful. Uh, to all the Uppsala students that I had a great pleasure to work with over the last year um, here at the climate meetings in Bonn and the December Climate Summit in Paris. And of course to you, Nicholas, um, 
for the vision to establish a really unique and path-breaking 10-year professorship in climate change leadership at a time when, as you noted, it's so profoundly needed. Um, with your generous support, we're inspiring a new generation of those scholars and activists and innovators that you talk about to become the next generation of climate leaders. Um, now, before I turn to my main task, which is to introduce our new visiting professor in climate change leadership, I wanted to share with you just a few parting thoughts um, about what I see as one of the most important elements of the work ahead of us to stop climate change and to address its impacts. And in a single word, it's compassion. I've spent a good deal of time over the past few months researching the policy and politics around what we might call climate migrants or climate refugees. As experts estimate that in the coming decades, something like 200 million people will be displaced around the world from climate impacts. From extreme events like cyclones and droughts and floods, and from slow onset impacts, impacts like sea level rise and desertification that will make lands where people are now eking out a living permanently uninhabitable. Some of those displaced by these events will be able to return to their homes after the waters have receded or after the rains have returned, but many will not. Many of those displaced will move internally. They'll be migrants in, in their own countries. Some will cross borders. Many of those who cross borders will, will cross borders in their region. And many will try to go wherever they consider they can have a safer life for themselves and their families. While I've been studying about climate refugees, um, I've also been watching with growing concern our collective global reaction to those fleeing the crisis in Syria. In Syria, seven million people are internally displaced. There's five million crossing international borders. That's a small fraction of the 200 million that experts say we should expect as temperatures reach two degrees above, above pre-industrial uh, pre levels or beyond, because we are now on a path to three or four or five degrees of warming. Protecting the most vulnerable in the world from climate impacts will require a different sort of reaction than the one that we've managed to come up with to protect those fleeing the crisis, the chaos, and the devastation in Syria. This is some of the very hard work that we must do collectively in the years ahead. Together, we have to figure out how to do things differently. This is one of the very profound challenges that we must prepare the next generation to take on. Challenges for which, Nicholas, there are no technological solutions, you know. Technology has solutions for many things, but, but where the solutions to this will have to come from the heart, where we, when we must allow ourselves to come face to face with the moral obligations we have to, to those with whom we share this planet. So let me end my time here as Enstrom Professor with a quote from the Dalai Lama. Love and compassion are necessities not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. Uh, so now to our new Zenstrom professor, or as he told me he would like to be introduced, Kevin from Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say a little bit more. Um, Kevin's professor of energy and climate change in the School of Mechanical, Aeronautical, and Civil Engineering at the University of Manchester. He's deputy director of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research, and he leads Tyndall Manchester's energy and climate change research program. There are scores more accolades that I could heap on, on Kevin, but you will come to know those and, and his, his uh, yes, the much work that he's done over, the, over your time with him. Kevin's work has been extremely and broadly influential across academia, government policymaking, and non-governmental organizations. And I speak for myself and many of my colleagues when I say that he's one of our most favorite climate scientists. Um, for the clarity and rigor of his analysis, 
his willingness to call out his fellow scientists and call them to task, and his courage to say clearly and loudly what many don't want to hear about the magnitude and urgency of the challenges ahead. Um, so it is really quite an honor, and it is with great admiration that I pass the torch, or perhaps pass the superhero cape of the Zenstrom professorship to Kevin. Welcome, Kevin, to Uppsala. Uh, we look forward to everything you'll bring to the community here, uh, starting with this inaugural lecture. anyway, so it's probably not too much of a problem. Um, I want to pick up during my presentation on, on what I see as the three principal elements of what you've spoken about here. So we had the VC emphasized right at the beginning, beginning the importance of time, and that runs right through everything I'm talking about here. And that is probably the one thing that we have very little of, and the one thing that we are reluctant to actively engage with. Nicholas talked about paradigm shift. Um, I'm not sure we're actually there yet. I think we can recognize we need one. We don't know what shape it will be, and I'll come back to that later in terms of our relationship with students. Um, but we definitely need a paradigm shift, or maybe a, parad some, a, a shift towards a suite of paradigms. And finally, I really liked Doreen's emphasis on that single word, compassion. And I'll try to come towards that at the end of my presentation. But as a mechanical engineer who spent my time designing and building oil rigs and working on ships. Um, the sort of the, the softer end of what's really important on climate change, issues like compassion and the social sciences are things that I'm, I'm really talking about that are well outside my area of expertise. But hopefully, as, as a citizen, we, we all have elements of, of compassion and love and recognition for the challenges within us. So my talk today is on climate change. Um, and I'm going to be focusing particularly on Paris. I called it here a tale of Parisian triumph and tragedy. Um, for those that engage in social media, uh, I have a Twitter account, which is only used for work, and I noticed there's also a hashtag, I think, for the event here today. Um, so, what was Paris? Well, it was probably the most, well, it certainly was the most important of a long series of international negotiations on climate change, from um, Kyoto, Rio, Kyoto, Copenhagen and then Paris. Prior to Paris, all countries of the world submitted pledges as to what they would do in terms of reducing their emissions by 2030. If you add up all of those pledges of our well-meaning leaders, they are putting us on a pathway towards a three or four degree C temperature rise. And let's be absolutely clear, that is a different planet from the one on which we live. The difference between now and an ice age is about five degrees. So three to four degrees C temperature rise across a century is not a planet that we would recognize. High carbon dioxide societies such as Sweden, the UK, the EU, US, and so forth, we have come to define dangerous climate change as two degrees, a rise in global average temperature of two degrees across the century. We broadly come to that because we think people like us, relatively wealthy people, can adapt our way out of the impacts. So we have come to that decision that two is appropriate. Paula, climatically vulnerable parts of the world with very low carbon dioxide emissions would argue for one or one and a half degrees C temperature rise. Because they are the ones that are going to suffer the impacts of our ongoing, knowing and profligate use of carbon, emissions of carbon. Paris was intended to, to address this gap between ambition and action. 
I think a backdrop to Paris is really important. And as you can see there, the faint line there, that's our carbon dioxide emissions in the background. Or I might think of it as a plot of our arrogance or lack of concern about the climate. Um, the message has changed little in over 25 years. The first IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Report, told us everything we needed to know about dealing with climate change or about the scale of the problem in 1990. That is before quite a few of you here were actually born. It's probably before some of your parents even met. So we've had a quarter of century of abject failure by people of my age, my generation, people with no hair or gray hair or dyed hair. We have failed the current generation, and we are failing them day in, day out at the moment. But we are doing much worse than just failing them. It's not that we haven't reduced our emissions. We've actually quite happily seen our emissions go up by 60%. This year, the emissions will be 60% higher than the year of 1990 of the IPCC report when we first pretended to care about climate change. That is a, a legacy of abject failure, and we should hang our heads in shame before starting to do something significant about it. A few moments of reflection of how my generation has failed. The other backdrop to Paris that I think is really important is what came out of the last IPCC report. And it's the move towards, if we're interested in temperature, it's carbon budgets that matter. These have huge political repercussions and social and cultural repercussions and technical repercussions. It's not long-term targets, a focus on 2050, which I see as not in my term of office if you're a politician, but indeed all of us. We all like the idea of focusing on 2050 because it means we can carry on living very much the lives that we are used to and like today and do not have to worry about climate change. But there is no science behind that. The science tells us it's the carbon budgets that matter. The more we emit today, the less our children and we can emit tomorrow. It's a very straightforward and brutal outcome of a simple budget framework. Just to put some sort of, I, I've deliberately today focused or moved away from lots of graphs and numbers, what I usually rely on, so I'm, I'm trying to make this a bit more accessible. There will be one or two graphs here, but this one is our carbon dioxide emissions going up. That's you know, 1990, that's when we first pretended to care about climate change, and that's where we are now. For, for, um, for Holding to 2 degrees centigrade is the carbon budget that matters, the area under the curve. It doesn't matter what happens down here. That's too late. We have to make sure that we hold that area as low as possible, as small as possible. If we delay mitigation, if we delay reducing our emissions today, then we'll have to compensate later if we can, if it is not too late. And that will mean much, much higher rates of reducing our emissions for our own children and for us in the future. So a very challenging outcome of moving towards carbon budgets and away from the much more attractive long-term targets. Let's go back to the Paris Agreement. Um, my provocation here is that in providing guidance to policymakers, and this is a provocation, so it, you could argue that it's, it is pushed a little bit further than it would be in a completely reasoned fashion, but in providing guidance to policymakers in the run-up to Paris, the scientific community of which many of us are part, have applied questionable assumptions and fine-tuned our analysis to align with political and economic sensibilities. We dare not question the economic paradigm that has dominated our society for at least 20, 30, or 40 years. And we will fine tune and adjust things to fit within that. We have ignored Richard Feynman, the famous 20th century physicist that hopefully some, if not all of you, have heard about. This is, he obviously, obviously wasn't talking directly about climate change here in 1986. But for successful technology, Reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. That was what he said in the inquiry on the Challenger um, accident, the space shuttle that blew up. And he oversaw that inquiry. A successful technology, reality must take uh, precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And I will come back to that later. So this is the Paris Agreement. Probably some of you were, were, were there. Some of you probably have had the pleasure of reading through the 32 pages of exciting text. Um, and there are some really important triumphs here, and I'm going to focus today, I'll focus most of my, my work on um, energy and climate change, recognizing that agriculture and uh, other industrial emissions are hugely important as well, but I focus mostly on energy. Um, and there are two really important triumphs from my perspective here. Firstly, and Nicholas already made this point, that the leaders of the world have recognized that the scientific framework of climate change is an accurate interpretation of the challenge we face. All leaders of the world effectively recognize that. The orchestrated assertions of skeptics and denialists were not what influenced the, the leaders in Paris. Just look at, let's just look at the speeches that were given. Okay, quite rhetorical as well, but nevertheless, they all broadly accept the climate challenge. They don't necessarily accept we have to do anything about it. 
but that's a different issue. The other, I think, really important triumph is this paragraph here, which I wouldn't expect you to read, and so I'll blow it up. And um, to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, and to pursue efforts to limit to one and a half degrees. To undertake rapid reductions in accordance with the best science and the basis of equity um, and efforts to eradicate poverty. So there's three, four rather really important things there. Well below two, one and a half, science and equity. And it's interesting in the penultimate text, uh, before the, you know, the text on the Friday, before the final text came out on the Saturday in Paris, there was no reference to science anywhere in the 32-page document. But quite a few of us were a little bit annoyed about that, and eventually it was put back in, whether it was our at our request or not, I'm not sure, but anyway. But these are really important because they allow us to hold our leaders to account. You can take these and you can say what is the scale of the challenge at the international level? What is the scale of the challenge for Sweden, for the Vice Chancellor, for us in our own lives? This provides us with the framework within which we can say, are we doing enough or are we letting our kids down, our children down? So we can, we, I will try to pull out some of that as we go through here. I had some issues with the Paris Agreement. Firstly, there's no reference to fossil fuels or decarbonisation in, in an agreement about climate change. No reference to fossil fuels or decarbonisation. Aviation and shipping were excluded, again. But that's the equivalent emissions of the UK and Germany added together and growing at a much faster rate. The voluntary pledges equated to three to four degrees C temperature warming. We were again playing it. We were playing poker with the future. The review of these, these pledges is not going to be till 2023, the serious main review. That's about 300 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide from now. One third of a reasonable chance of two degrees C would have been blown just between the emissions between now and when we review the INDCs. They're already far too weak. There's a fundamental reliance on negative emission technologies, and I'm going to come back to that later, so I'm not going to talk about that now, but you know, methods for, for extracting CO2 from the atmosphere. Directly. And I'm going to just touch on this one. Uh, there's $100 billion per annum finance to help developing nations cope with climate change. And a lot of people said this was a really positive step forward. I think this is derisory. That shows about how much we really care about the poor, poor parts of the world. The Swedish economy in 2015 was $491 billion. That's about five times more in that one year than we're offering the poor parts of the world to deal with climate change. In fact, the economy went down by quite a lot that year. If you took the previous year, it was about... Um, I think about 542 or something billion dollars. So Sweden's GDP is much bigger than the money we're going to give to the rest of the world, the majority of the world. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, um, estimate of direct and indirect subsidies, most of the indirect subsidies are health issues to do with fossil fuels, for 2015 um, was $5.3 trillion from the IMF. Not really a left-wing think tank. I mean, they're usually quite conservative. 53 times more to fossil fuels than we're prepared to give to poorer parts of the world to deal with the impacts of climate change that we have imposed upon them. That's what the Paris Agreement is about. But there are, as I say, some important triumphs. Before Paris, according to the International Energy Agency, we're heading to four to six degrees C level of warming. And I know there are people here that say there's not enough fossil fuels for that, and other people may disagree with some of the science behind it. But broadly, that's the sort of direction we were heading, somewhere up that sort of curve. With Paris, we're heading to somewhere three to four degrees C, and we've said that we're going to commit to two degrees centigrade. And in fact, one and a half would be considerably tighter than that. And I'll come back to one and a half a little bit later. So that's, that's what we're trying to aim at. What does this mean for our energy system? Which is my focus here today, and most of my work. Well, firstly, it means you have to have deep cuts in energy demand here. Now, I would argue that, Nicholas, before, you were talking about this section and we can come back to that later, about entrepreneurs that by and large are producing things that can enter a marketplace. This part here, a large part of that requires, if, any, if entrepreneurs at all, it requires cultural entrepreneurs that see the world differently. Because here, we can't use technology because we cannot do it quickly enough. And as an engineer, I find that you know, a sad state of affairs. If we started in 1990, we would have had plenty of time we waited to 2016, and we've still not started. So the time gets more and more challenging. But the entrepreneurs, the disruptive technologies, but indeed the te technologies we have already that we are not even prepared to use, we don't just need new technologies, we're not even prepared to use the ones we do have. We, can, we need that to move us further down this curve. 
And all of this is a global picture. But we signed up in Paris to do this on the basis of equity. Same with Copenhagen, with the um, uh, Camp David Declaration in Rio. We've always used equity. We've held it up there as something important in relation to climate change. And we've actually defined it to some extent around when the peaks of emissions will be. But let's quickly, before I discuss equity a bit more um, on this, let's just have a look at what might happen in the next few years. In the next three to 13 years, we will have used up all of the one and a half degree C temperature budget for energy. The pledges are not until 2023. From a budget perspective, it is too late for one and a half degrees. And let's also be quite clear about this. At two degrees, many people will die. And we broadly know who they are. They'll be poor, they'll typically be non-white, and they'll live a long way from here, and they'll almost always be low emitters. So we know who is going to die because of the way that we are living our lives over here. We don't know their names, but we know which groups they live in. Even at one and a half degrees C, the impacts will be quite severe. And already we're starting to see severe impacts in some parts of the world. But we now have no chance for this based on the science. That's not to say it hasn't got important political um, relevance to the debate on climate change. For two degrees centigrade, remember two degrees centigrade is the threshold that we broadly hold as a, in, in the West anyway, between dangerous and acceptable climate change. The 66% chance of that has gone. The 50% chance would require a warlike footing on mitigation. And none of us think climate change is that serious. Just look at our own lives. Look at our leaders' lives. Look at our institutions. Look at our governments. No one in the world thinks climate change is that important. So that's gone. So we're left with an outside chance of two degrees centigrade. Now, because many of you here are interested in climate change, I'm sure you would never dream of getting on a plane. But for those of you that maybe know people who do get on them, would they possibly accept only a 33% chance of landing safely? There's only 400 people on a plane. Here we're talking about 7 billion people. So look at our attitude towards risk there. So what's this mean for poorer and richer nations? I'm simply dividing this between the old sort of Annex 1 and, and um, non-Annex 1 or wealthy industrialized countries and industrializing and poorer countries. So you can have a more nuanced split if you want. We can discuss that maybe later. Let's imagine the poor parts of the world peak their emissions by 2025. That is a huge ask. China says it'll be 2030 for them. India says 2040. If that's the case, then we may as well forget 2 degrees C and probably heading towards 3 and well above it. But actually, when you talk to Chinese scholars, you look at what's happening in China, you look at some of the, um, yeah, economically, but also in terms of technology and so forth, 2025 looks viable for the poor parts of the world, and China dominate the emissions in those other parts of the world. But then imagine that they start to reduce their emissions by 10% per annum by 2035. 10% every year. That's about three times whole, higher than most neoclassical economists would say is possible with economic growth, um, or astrologists as I often refer to them. Um, so 10%, at least when it comes to looking at system-level issues. That means they would have to fully decarbonize their energy system, their planes, their ships, their houses, their fridges, many of which, of course, they don't have at the moment, by 2050. Zero carbon, not low, pr pretty much zero carbon energy by 2050. And then we know that carbon budgets are from the IPCC. We have the range there, and we can make some quite sort of simple bit of maths. You don't require an integrated assessment model or a big computer, just a calculator. Um, and you can work out that for people like us in the wealthy parts of the world, we need at least 10% per annum reductions. We think it's quite a lot higher than that now, nearer 13 to 14%, but that's work that's ongoing looking at the budget. What would that mean? What would it mean for our lives? What would it mean for Uppsala University, for Uppsala Municipal um, Region? What would it mean for Sweden, for the UK, for the wealthy parts of the world? 50% reduction in our total emissions, including aviation and shipping, which of course are exempt in all of our accounting frameworks. Um, by 2020. 75% reduction by 2025. Is that, is that something we're aiming at? 90% reduction by 2030. Zero carbon energy across the full system in the next 20 years. That's for an outside chance of 2 degrees centigrade, at which anyway many people will die. What have we submitted by the EU, Sweden, the UK at the moment, at least for the next two years? Um, you know, we're all in the EU. We've submitted a 40% reduction by 2030 less than half of what we would need to deliver. So for poorer parts of the world, they would need to have zero carbon by 2050. For richer the parts of the world, much earlier by 2035. That's the scale of the challenge that we have. 
Now, how is it that I'm able to say this based on IPCC carbon budgets and some basic maths, when actually, this is a quote from the chair of working group three of the IPCC, the different working groups, working group one looks at the science, working group three, primarily are economists and other techno-economists, and um, you know, they take a different approach to these issues. Global economic growth would not be strongly affected. What, by in zero carbon, by 2035? In the UK, this is a quote from our Committee on Climate Change, the good news is that two degrees uh, reductions are possible without sacrificing the benefits of economic growth and rising prosperity. Because we have to hold to that dogma. We're never allowed to question that. You can question physics, but we mustn't question those. <laughs> and that's probably our fundamental difficulty with our current paradigm. So how do we hold these two together? We have to have a magician's approach here. And I'm only talking about one of the tricks we're using, but the principal trick is negative emission technologies. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be researching them. I'm not saying they aren't important for us in universities to consider. What I'm saying is that these technologies should not be assumed to work. And as I'll say in a minute, they'll, they dominate the scenario space. This means sucking CO2, to put it bluntly, directly from the atmosphere from 2030 and beyond. The common one approach people are talking about that dominate the, the models that advise governments is BECS, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. You grow trees and plants. They absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. You, you harvest the trees. You, you uh, transport them around the, around the planet to all the power stations. You burn them in the power stations very inefficiently. You, burn, you capture the carbon dioxide, what you can, that goes up the chimney. You liquefy it or almost liquefy it. It's a phase change state. And then you pump it underground and hold it there for a few thousand years. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Yeah. We can do that, we can find a way of transporting, in my case, 90 kilograms of flesh, six miles, six kilometers, without getting in a car that weighs 1,000 kilograms, or the average weight of a Swedish car, 1,523 kilograms, which is more than the European average. Um, yeah, we have to find alternative ways of doing this. This has never worked at scale. There are huge technical and economic unknowns. As an engineer, I find it just really quite disturbing that we're going to take an inefficient thermodynamic process called power stations, and we're going to add on the back end of it this thing, which is a grunt technology, which makes the thing 15 to 25% more inefficient again. You know, James Watt would be turning in his grave if we thought we got to the level of efficiency we're heading to now, or inefficiency. And there's limited biomass availability. Nine billion people on the planet would like to have a meal from time to time. And yeah, we'd like to also think there might be national parks and you know, maybe, maybe nature's got some actual, you know, maybe not intrinsic value is the, right, is the wrong approach, but it has value in and of itself, regardless of what we, what we think about it. But in this case, we're going to have to convert large parts of the planet to producing biomass. What levels are we talking about here? Planting one to three times the area of India, year after year, decade after decade, to store hundreds of billions of tons of CO2, securing underground for thousands of years. Just to give you some sense of what the scenarios are pointing out, about 10 to 20 billion tons is quite common in a lot of the scenarios to be stored every year. We, we actually produce about 4 billion tons of concrete, of cement rather. Cement and concrete are the most used material after water on, on this planet. When we produce 4 billion tons of that, we produce 1.6 billion tons of steel, 1.3 billion tons of municipal waste, and we're going to store every single year 10 to 20 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere when it's at very low concentration. I mean, this is utter madness. You know, this, is, this, that, this is what we're relying on. But is it what we're relying on? As I say, we should be researching these things, but they're not an insurance policy, but we should be researching them. But you look at these IPCC scenarios, 90% for a 50-50 chance of 2 degrees C includes BECS, 90% of them. That is a systemic bias. 80% of those that go from 480 to, to 720 ppmv include BECS. And even those up to 1,000 ppmv, about half of the scenarios include it. We cannot think of another way around it. And why? Because if we do, it means we have to, think, we have to question our economic paradigm. And we mustn't question that. So Paris, some academics and politicians, rather than focus on deep and urgent mitigation today, because that has challenging political and economic repercussions, you know, we, we can't just blame our leaders for that. That's exactly the same for our lives, how we run our research communities, how we do our own research, how we run our universities. We're all party to this. Instead of that, we prefer to rely on non-existent negative emission technologies to suck huge quantities of CO2 from the air in the future. That's the choice we're making, rather than that one. So let's go back to Feynman. For successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. We, the academic community, are trying to fool nature, and we know we're going to lose. 
We just hope we won't be caught out in the interim. So, yeah, we, we and uh, not just the academic community, the NGO community, the business community, we are all trying to fool nature here. And we, it's a big collective cognitive dissonance. We all know we're doing it, but no one dares shout out that the emperor's got no clothes. It's also, I think, disturbing that the laws of physics, which have had, you know, fairly successful for about 13 billion years, are now being chumped by economic rules that are devised by a handful of people and, have had, and are just literally an ephemeral construct. That's all they are. They're not, they're not laws of nature. Why are we beholden to the latter? Why are we beholden to that one, not the first one? So let's go back to 2 degrees C. You could argue this is all quite depressing, but I think actually the first thing you have to do before you try to solve a problem is just ask, what is the problem? Um, right, back to 3 degrees C. Is it still a viable goal? And my hypothesis is yes, just. I think we still can hold to 2 degrees centigrade. And the two things I'm going to touch on here, technology and then equity. So technology, a lot of people think of it still as a saviour to the status quo. We hope that technology will allow us, whether that's wind turbines, nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, whatever it might be, we hope that it will allow us to carry on living very high energy consumption lifestyles. If not, it, has, it say, begs fundamental questions about how we live our lives, and we don't want to ask those questions. <coughs> so technology, what can it do? As an engineer, it can do a huge amount. I'm going to touch on supply and demand, delivering low carbon, zero carbon um, energy, and really, we have to aim for zero carbon energy, not even low carbon energy, because otherwise the CO2 just keeps accumulating in the atmosphere and the temperature will go up at a slower rate. And then looking at demand, how can you use less energy for the same level of services? So, you know, there are lots of, I'm not going to go into these in any detail, lots of you here know much more about them than me. There are a whole suite of technologies for having low carbon, very low carbon electricity, geothermal, Wind turbines, nuclear power, that's where I used to live next door to. My dad worked there. That's the new one in the UK. It was built in the 1980s. Our new one, built in the 1980s. Um, a hydro scheme, solar panels. There's also biomass, and you can argue about sustainability and, and also its neutrality in terms of climate, in terms of carbon. Tidal, wave, and also carbon capture and storage. I put it here with a question mark because I see it not as a low carbon technology, but as a medium carbon technology. Carbon footprint for, CS, for carbon capture and storage across the lifetime is somewhere in this sort of 80 to 150, maybe up to 200 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour if you take it across the full life cycle. That's, that's what the estimates are in the literature that I'll come across. Um, but it's much lower than, say, gas on its own, which is about 450, parts per, um, uh, 450 um, uh, grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. So supply, we can do. But all of those examples I give you, gave you there, pretty much except for biomass, was for electricity. And electricity, although it begins in A and ends in Y, is not the same thing as energy. It's only 20% of the energy we consume globally, on average, is, is electricity. 80% of it is not. Even in Sweden, 70% of the energy you consume in Sweden, probably slightly more than that because it ignores aviation and shipping because they're the responsibility of, I don't know, God or someone else because no country takes account for those. Um, so about 30 to 33% in Sweden is electricity. 70% is not electricity. So what options are there for decarbonizing the rest? What zero carbon options are there outside of electricity? You really stop and think what they are. So we have to, have, really, there have to have a massive electrification program. In the UK, I would argue we need to increase it from 20% to about 80% of our energy demand to be met by electricity. Heating, transport, industry, wherever you reasonably can do that. Because you can make low carbon electricity. Sustainable biomass and biofuel, that's another option. Um, but remember, we're using a lot of this for VEX, which is power generation anyway. Um, and we also want to feed ourselves and all the other things that we want to do with, with, uh, with biomass. Hydrogen, but that often requires electrolysis, which requires you to have power stations anyway. Or you can use thermal decomposition, but that is normally that would be proposed to be done by certain types of nuclear reactors, which would also be generating electricity. So this is effectively electricity anyway. It's just a vector for carrying it. And there are others. You can use wind for ships, and we're, we're working in Manchester uh, with colleagues at UCL on, on how viable is wind for ships using kites and other types of technologies and Fletner rotors and things. So there are things you can do, but hugely challenging. What's the headline for fossil fuels? And it's really clear. To meet the Paris commitments, we have to have over 80% of existing reserves, existing reserves, must remain in the ground. Um, and that's probably near the, sort of the, the middle range for 2 degrees C. 1.5 degrees C would be much more than that. That means coal now. We cannot we can continue to burn coal, and certainly not looking to explore any more coal. The UK has just given permission for a new open cast coal mine in the UK. Oil, 
Also, we cannot carry on burning the oil that we're burning now. We cannot be finding new, um, you know, new sources. Why on earth are we looking for tar sands? We cannot even burn what we have available now. So that's got to go. And even the European um, panacea to all problems, gas. You know, gas is methane, CH4. Just do the molecular balance of that, and you'll find out that 75% of the, of the mass of gas is carbon. And when you burn it, you get lots of carbon dioxide. It is not low carbon. It is high carbon. Gas gone as well. It also tells us for the time frame for 2 degrees C, which is incredibly short, that carbon capture and storage can only have a very minor role to play, and probably only in the poorer parts of the world where their budget is slightly bigger and they have slightly longer to make the transition. But CCS, as it is at the moment, could not be a major part of that unless we can reduce its emissions by an order of magnitude. Unconventional shale gas, tar sands and so forth have little to no role to play. So this is, you know, just compare that with the UK where we're developing um, you know, new coal, where we're, where we're trying to pursue everything we can in the North Sea. Norway's just the same. You know, Sweden's merrily selling off one of its power stations to someone, and one of its mines to someone else to use. You know, none of us are really cared about this at all. None of us are trying to do this, hold the stuff in the ground. So we're all pointing completely the wrong direction. So for supply, the headline message is too little too late. We should have done something a long time ago. Yeah, we're, we're here now. Well, we're probably somewhere between here and here, really. Um, and how long do we have? No time at all, really, to make that complete transition. Decarbonizing the energy supply will take several decades. It's not going to be, even if we had, even if we actually thought it was important and started to do it, which we're not really, only really, we're only playing at the fringes at the moment. Um, look at what we're doing with renewables. We're not substituting for fossil fuels, we're complementing. They are being used on top of the fossil fuels. In 2016, we have no such luxury of these time frames. Zero carbon supply is essential, but it is insufficient. You cannot solve the problem with that technology. Well, technology is, but they are absolutely essential. So demand, what can you do there? I'm going to touch on one of these, and that's private cars. Now, we've heard all the talk about Tesla, but that sort of thing, that sort of process will take a little while to do. You know, to complete transition to electric cars would mean we've got to do quite a lot with the grid, um, expanding of the grid. We've got to think about intermittency issues if you're using renewables. We've got to think about how we set that infrastructure up. There are plenty of things we can do, and as engineers, that's an exciting prospect. We can solve those problems, but not immediately. But today, emissions from the EU and the US, about 12 to 15 percent of emissions come from private car use. There are now 300 model variants of petrol and diesel cars, not electric, not even hybrid these that are less than 100 grams of, of carbon dioxide per kilometre, between 85 and 100 grams. The average in Sweden, if you look at the Swedish cars, I, don't, I, haven't, I couldn't find the figure last night. My guess is about 165 grams for a car that's driven on the road. New cars being sold in Sweden are slightly above the European average, about 135 grams. So yeah, we're way above that now in what we're actually doing. And it's also, and there's no price premium for these cars. These, are, these cost you no more than, a, than the average Volvo, which is quite pricey anyway. Um, Two-thirds of all car travel is by vehicles that are eight years old or younger. That's really helpful, because actually the natural replacement rate is very rapid. So imagine that you set a stringent CO2 standard, not the one we've got in the EU, which is quite weak, well, very weak, but something that actually we can deliver today. Then with existing petrol and diesel cars, these are cars that are already being sold, so these are not, they do not require new technology for this. With no additional capital cost, it costs you nothing, unless you want to have a, a scrapping scheme, but they're just a natural replacement of these vehicles. Reduced operating costs, you need a lot less fuel. Identical infrastructure, same roads, same petrol stations, and so forth, so no change to infrastructure. Same employment in the same companies. The companies that make the good cars also make the bad cars, the efficient and the inefficient. So this is a no-brainer, isn't it? Any politician who thinks climate change is important says, well, there's not, where's the, lose, the loss in here? We could deliver probably 50 to 70 percent reduction in about 10 years from doing this. And in the UK, you'd be, you'd be opposed by, we have a paper called the Daily Mail and a te television program called Top Gear, some of you might have seen. And then there's sort of their macho programs that cars are a substitute for, male, for men's ego, um, buying those sorts of cars. Uh, and that has dominated why it is that we have these incredibly powerful vehicles. But we could actually, if we felt it was serious, at no cost, make that transition very rapidly. Now, we need to make electric cars, and we need to start cycling and using public transport, and maybe traveling less as well. But this is just saying, with existing technology, what you can do. More generally, establish stringent efficiency standards across everything that we do, tighten them year on year, provide a really clear long-term market signal to help with innovation and so forth. Remember, they, are, they get tightened. And industrialized wealthy nations, from the sort of provisional work we've done, and we're trying to get funding to look at this in more detail, would mean a 40 to 70% reduction in about 10 years. We could power down how much energy we use. 
Now, if you put that alongside the low carbon supply, you're starting to move in the right direction towards dealing with climate change. And I, I, the final, I'm not going to talk about that now, but issues of rebound that we often spend the money we save on jet skis or more holidays. So we have to do, and that's not a small issue in terms of policies. Um, but technology is not, is not sufficient. Technology alone cannot maintain emissions within carbon budgets that accompany the Paris commitments. Rapid and deep mitigation from changes in what we do, how we do it, and how often we do it are absolutely critical. So I'm going to sort of pull together the final section of slides on the issue of equity and trying to think about what that might mean um, for mitigation, particularly because there's a massive CO2 asymmetry. So behind all this, remember, I'm thinking we're doing the technical stuff. Lucas um, and Piketty, Lucas and Piketty, prior to uh, Paris, uh, produced a report called Extreme Carbon Inequality. Oxfam produced a report that came out during Paris and broadly holding that 50% of global CO2 emissions come from about 10% of the global population. That's not just in the wealthy parts of the world. There are 300 million people in China that consume energy like we do as the average European. Just think about what that means. The top 1% of US emitters, a small number of people, 3.5 million people, have carbon footprints that are 2,500 times higher, 2,500 times higher than the bottom 1%. The emissions are highly skewed towards a particular group of people. And that's really helpful, because then we have to think about, well, what are the policy implications of that? Let's just remember as well that 2 degrees C is a short-term challenge. We ha Although the temperature may take quite a while to reach 2 degrees C, actually doing something about it is, what, is, you know, is the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. It's a really short-term challenge. It's a consumption and not a population issue. A lot of us like to think it's a population issue. It's about the poor becoming wealthy and having fridges and cars. We like that because it means we can carry on doing the things that we're doing today. There's no maths behind it, of course, because the poor will not become sufficiently wealthy in the time frame we have to deal with 2 degrees C for their emissions to really matter. So it's about those of us that consume a lot today consuming even more, and about those that are just entering our group also consuming more. So the 10% are key to delivering on the Paris commitments. And I think this is, I, I, I've used this quite a few times, and other people aren't quite as shocked by this as I was when I first did it. I still am slightly shocked by this. If the top 10% of global emitters reduced their carbon footprint to the level of the average European, now that's not too impoverished, the average European, that's a 33% cut in emissions. Now I would argue if you think climate change is really important, if it is an existential threat, then we do that immediately. Even if you reduce the average level of the Americans, we still have a 15% reduction in emissions, rather than the INDCs, the pledges, that see 2030 emissions being higher than 2016 emissions. So there are plenty of things that we can do, but yeah. why are we not doing them? Well, that's what I'm trying to point out now. Who is in this key 10% group? <laughs> Climate scientists. I'm not naming all of those in this group, but uh, you know, broadly, when you shave in the morning or when you put on your makeup, you see the person staring back from the mirror. We know who they are. These wonderful elites. Yeah, private jet, private yacht. Ooh, doesn't climate matter? Yeah, private ranch that has an energy bill of about fifteen thousand dollars. Uh, you know, people that fly over the world, probably in business class or first class. Well, all in private jets. The climate elites. They're in the top one percent. Frequent flyers, if you get on a plane, which I'm sure those of us who work on climate change don't, but if you did, then that, that group, again, are in the 10% category. Audiences, anyone who bothers to turn up for climate change talk is in that group or aspiring to be there as quickly as possible. <laughs> so we know who this group is. Why have we not, I, I, I checked with Isaac, so if this word is, is, is not right to be used in Sweden, blame Isaac. Um, yeah, you know, this is the this is the fox guarding the chicken coop. Why have we not mitigated? Because it is us high t high carbon dioxide foxes that have to develop the policies to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. Yeah, you know, so we are the fox trying to guard the chicken coop. Yeah, you know, do we have sufficient altruism as a fox to say let's put some better fencing in around the chickens? Why have our messages been ignored? This took me ages last night doing this, 2.30 in the morning. 
So, you know, this is us going to Rio, Cancun, Bali, or Paris. No, it's always somewhere nice. Yeah, we've got places in the UK you can come. Yeah, Bognor, places like that. We have the next cop there. Hmm? So, and, it, and from these planes with our megaphone, we're telling the little people beneath to reduce their emissions. Yeah, that hasn't worked. I can't see why. This is a paper that came out in June of this year. Statements about climate researchers' carbon footprints affect the credibility and the impact of their advice. It's quite an interesting paper about how they managed to, you know, to, to survey that sort of outcome. This is really interesting. This basically says that if we don't demonstrate it as climate researchers, as universities, as thought leaders in our society, if we don't demonstrate it, why should anyone take any notes of us? You're, you're suffering from smoking, you're trying to give it up, you go to the doctor and she's sat there chain smoking. You're not going to take so much notice as if the doctor actually had given up smoking and struggled themselves. So, you know, the, it may not change the veracity, the truth of our message, or, the, the, or the, the substance of our message, but it does change the credibility. At least that's what this research is suggesting. And anecdotally, that seems to fit quite well with my own experience, but that's just anecdote. Equity frames a new mitigation agenda. Most of the seven billion, heading up towards nine perhaps, have little scope to reduce their emissions. They're not high emitters. They are just trying to eke out a living day in, day out, and deal with the climate change impacts that we are superimposing on top of the problems that some of them already suffer, which are not all caused by us, sometimes are self-inflicted by their own governments. But we are opposing another stress on top of them. There is a huge asymmetry in responsibility. There are massive rapid and near-term reductions available if people like us could, would actually say we will change our lives today and start making fundamental adjustments to how we live our lives. And the real opportunity for leading by example, that the rest of the world is crying out for people to be examples. And Nicholas pointed that out on the sort of product point of view, but I would argue this just from how we live our lives we, and how we run our universities and our institutions, these cultural, these organizational, organizational setups need to be thought through. And it's not that that in itself is of importance, it's actually that catalyzes system change. The individuals provide examples to policymakers that can be scaled up. Climate change demands system change. Interpreting the Paris commitments through the brutal, and, and I think it is brutal, scientific logic of carbon budgets begs fundamental questions of contemporary norms and paradigms. The ones that we, we just we don't even think about as we get out of bed and do whatever we do every single day. We have to start to question those every single day. On the supply side, as I said before, we need to phase out all fossil fuels in the next few years. These fossil fuels have been phenomenally successful in driving the Industrial Revolution. A lot of the benefits of our society have come from these fossil fuels um, you know, powering it. We have to replace that with zero carbon energy supply. But it has qualitatively different characteristics to fossil fuels. It's not one for one. There are significant differences in living with this sort of energy from that. However much we try to play out or try to um, overcome some of those differences, there will be differences in them. We need the near wholesale electrification of society's energy needs. Now, this is hugely challenging for supply in the next 20 to 35 years. On demand, we need immediate and str uh, stringent um, uh, and dynamic efficiency standards that drive out inefficient equipment. But also, in doing that, they will at least initially they'll drive out the luxury market, by and large. And that means they drive out what differentiates us in terms of status. Why does a VC live in a bigger house? Why does a professor live in a bigger house than a student? Yeah, we all do that. As we progress through our lives, and notice that even progress through our lives, what we mean by that? Progress is to get wealthier. As we go through our lives, we get wealthier, we consume more stuff, we have bigger houses, bigger cars, we travel further on nicer planes, that are, we're on business class. It is all about status. At least not all, but much of our life is about representing ourselves in this modern paradigm in terms of status. And this will be unpicked if we have these efficiency standards, at least in the short to medium term. This is a severe curtailment of choice for a small proportion of the population, again, we know who they are, um, that we've come to expect, and all in the next one to ten years. And when it comes to equity, however packaged, carbon budgets will have to be rationed. In the UK, people do not like using that word, but why not use the word if it says what it means? You know, it does what it says in the tin, as the expression we use in the UK. We're going to have to ration out the carbon budget, and price is not the appropriate way you do that. When we had to ration out food during the war, we didn't say the wealthy can eat more. We said that it's appropriate that everyone has a fair and reasonable diet. And carbon is that essential as well. Access to fossil fuels in the short to medium term is that essential. In the longer term, we can phase our way out of it. The implications for social structures, hierarchies, economic paradigms, issues of growth, 
discount rates, all the things that we've normalized again, will be profound, at least until we get zero carbon supply rolled out. And then we can go back to the old paradigm, if we think that's a wonderful world we live in, sustainability might have some broader concerns about this, but questions about it, but if we want to go back to the way we live today and equity and all those other things, then fine, we can do that, only when you've got the low carbon supply in place. I'm going to start that now. Climate change is system change. We have a choice. We can continue our insincere platitudes on mitigation, and let's be blunt, that's what they are. We can ignore the poor, the, climate, the climatically vulnerable, and we can hand over to our children a future of rapidly changing climate, or of a rapidly changing climate. Or we can grasp the nettle. We can recognize this is a difficult problem and say we're up to the task. We can begin immediate and radical program of decarbonization, and we can shape a new and prosperous post-carbon society. I don't, don't think it'll be less than two degrees C, so we also have to be able to deal with the impacts of that as well. And time is short. So my final slide, as I always use, is from, I've never paid him any royalties, um, it's from Robert Unger, and I just like this slide, I think it captures you know, our complacency in the world in which we live. At every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. Now that is what we come to university for. We imagine different futures. And in this case, I'm slightly reversed around what the BC said. It's not necessarily about us inspiring the students. We can tell them about the problem because we've fundamentally failed. But we can't tell them about the solutions because we don't know what they are. So in this sense, I think the inspiration may all also come the other way around. The students can inspire our, our generation to actually make change. But we need to imagine different futures, multiple futures and low-carbon futures. And then we also have a job to do in providing clarity as to what do they mean? What do they look like? How would you get there? Policymakers don't, don't just need narratives, they need route maps as well. So we, now that is our role in informing the policy realm, in, in informing civil society. And I think I'm going to catch that really well here. That, that is what our task should be in Uppsala in the climate change leadership um, uh, program that's been developed here. So on that final upbeat note, thank you very much for listening. much, Kevin, uh, for that really sort of profound, inspiring, very challenging, yes, very challenging introduction to your time here. Um, the next part of our morning is going to be a, a panel discussion with Kevin. We've got three distinguished colleagues in the audience that we've invited to join Kevin to ask Kevin some questions, to reflect on Kevin's talk. And then after that, we'll, we'll open to questions both from the audience. And there should be someone with cards. There should be some card. Is there someone to mediate that? There are post-its. Oh, there's post-its on every seat for your questions. And there's also, for those of you who are joining us from afar, there's a Twitter hashtag, and you can post your questions on Twitter, and someone is going to help me, Daniel's going to help me collect those uh, questions that come in. So let me invite our distinguished colleagues um, who are going to join Kevin. So Anneli Eklund is an environmental historian and senior lecturer in the Department of Archaeology. I'm going to ask all four of you to come up here, and you're going to have to share two microphones. Um, we have Marika Adolf, who's professor in the Department of Engineering Sciences. She's chair of the advisory group for the Zenstrom Professorship and the Center for Sustainable Development, and she's one of the pioneers in Sweden of, of thin film solar technology. Um, and uh, from the Norwegian Business School, Per Espen, author, economist, Per Espen Stuckness, author, economist, organizational psychologist, and uh, author of a new book, relatively recent book, called uh, What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Global Warming. Um, so thank you all three of you for um, 
coming here and and contributing to this conversation. And and I guess maybe I'll start at the, the far end with Per Espen, ask you to um, to provide some remarks and then move along and, and see where we get to. That's great. I, I hit that button. Does it come out? Anybody hear me? Should I just speak loudly? Or there's another? Hello. Yes. <laughs> now. So, dear Kevin, thanks for a real um, fire thrower lecture. Um, really appreciate it. And um, I really think also we have uh, uh, so basic common goals and um, you really have a wonderful voice in, in bringing this out in a, in a both warm and critical um, fashion and uh, I really hope you and we uh, succeed. Uh, however, listening to you, I get deja vu's all the time. Um, uh, my closest colleague has been Jürgen Randers uh, who wrote Limits to Growth back in 1972. And uh, they had a team that sold 12 to 15 million copies of a book that fundamentally questioned the economic growth thinking. And he's been doing that for 40 years uh, since, uh, saying that if we don't uh, change uh, the economic growth model and bring our emissions down, we will have overshoot and collapse of these. And to my ears, your message is identical to that message that has been repeated 40 years over. And the question is, um, when you do a psychological segmentation of the audience in our societies, about 10 to 15% uh, can be categorized as alarmed. They have understood, they've heard you. And when we get together these kind of audiences, uh, typically we are academic, scientifically oriented, concerned. Um, we, we share in, in, in what Doreen called for compassion. And I'm so happy for we have both the compassion and the, the equity up here as well. Yet, um, it's not those 12 to 15% of the population who make up a majority. And probably the people who need to hear your message is not here. Why are they not here? Why do we self-select this audience in such a way? And part of that reason is that uh, the narrative within which this is presented is one of impending doom and apocalypse. Uh, so after listening to you, uh, killing the 66%, killing the 50%, and ridiculing the 33%, uh, I'm not sure if I'm really engaged or have much more fundamental faith in humanity's capacity to move forward to this. So what I, what I lack in your narrative, and I will challenge to you, is why is that um, two degree goal not just possible, but inevitable? How can it be that humanity is going to respond? What are the driving forces, the underlying human capacity we have to respond to crisis so that we will succeed given we give it what we have? So I want, just want to throw in a little bit of good news in this. First, last week we set a world record in Chile a new solar plant was, is, is being contracted that would produce power cheaper than any available technology in the world, down to three US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, we have, as we speak, a major energy revolution going on where the cost curves of solar is just cutting the crap of any coal, any oil, any gas executive, just blowing them out of business. It's so disruptive, it's happening so quickly that few people really understand this exponential logic. I challenge you to really look into what the exponential, we're talking about 33, 36% compound annual growth rates in solar panels. If you have that growth rate, we have a very different world in just 10 years. Um, have a few more minutes, one more minute, yeah. <laughs> Sweden, dear Sweden, I'm Norwegian, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I love you, Sweden. I analyzed a few numbers from OECD, uh, and since 2000, Sweden is the leading country in the world in terms of green growth. Core carbon productivity improves by more than 5% per year, and that is above what IPCC 2014 summary for polar makers set up as the target. If more countries did as Sweden, we are solving the climate problem, and it's getting easier by the month for other countries to, to keep doing this. Denmark is breathing you in the neck. 
And if you don't watch out, Denmark will surpass you. Why? Because they're much better at wind power. Finland is doing great stuff on biofuels as well. And Norway, sorry, I'll, I'll just skip Norway. <laughs> but watch out for China, the world's biggest emitter, because back in the years, we have economic data we analyzed from 2000 to 2010, they have a terrible, 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 despairing coal-based economy. Then a miracle happened. From 2014 to 2000 and, no, sorry, 2012 to 2014, their carbon productivity is growing by more than 5% per year. So they are now almost surpassing Sweden in turning their economy around quickly enough to solve this problem. China is shutting down thousands and thousands of coal mines. They are taking down coal plants much quicker than they're building new ones. And their policies in terms of meat reduction, rationing meat, their policies in terms of pushing electric bikes, their policies in terms of doing electric buses is amazing. They are not just ordering a one electric bus or two, they are ordering in by the tens of thousands for BYD, build your dreams. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's it. Doreen now. <laughs> so that was a few news on the good side, and I think it's inevitable right, where we will proceed, and I'd like you to explore why this keeps accelerating and how we can add to that. Thanks. Passing the, the mic to Annalie uh, for some reflections. Uh, so I would also like to thank you. I think your picture is very clear and very straightforward. And in some way, you actually do manage to be discouraging and hopeful at the same time. Uh, and it's quite difficult to disagree with you, or to, but you did ask us to be a little bit critical. Uh, so I'm going to try now. <laughs> uh, so, funnily enough, I had written in my notes as a question exactly the Robert Unger quote you brought up in the end, uh, because I think it's a good quote. Um, but one problem, and it goes with this quote, is I think while talking, so you talked a lot about the necessity of paradigm shifts, the problems with structures, uh, theories that we just believe in, but you know, that we need to think more about, is that when we talk about these matters, even while being critical about them, we also reproduce them as necessities. So we're doing exactly what Robert Unger is warning us against. So, and one, one paradigm or one big problem is the belief that there are irreconcilable, irreconcilable things that we can't reconcile. So. I, I actually, though I'm not an economist, uh, I have problems with your representation of economy. Because I think if we keep being stuck in this, this eternal debate that began a long time ago about growth and degrowth, we, we're not actually talking about the problem because that is not the problem. The problem is not economic growth necessarily, it's what we do with that growth. So I think we actually need to you know, we as scientists have to overbridge that, that gap that doesn't really exist, rather than reproducing it. Um, and also, as an historian, uh, I, I think, so you talked a lot about structures, and, and from history we can learn that there has been a number of occasions where you know, society has, has been in big trouble and they have actually managed to make a change. Uh, but there are also examples where, where for several reasons the, the problem was recognized, a lot of people tried, but it didn't work out because there were structures that were inhibiting those changes. Uh, and often those structures are not the apparent ones. It, it's not the one we would first, you know, when we look at the situation, we say, oh, of course, it's that one. But often it's other ones that we don't see. Uh, so uh, if you disregard, my question to you is disregard, okay, you're not allowed to bring up economic theory as an inhibiting structure. Go under that and, and think about, uh, okay, why is it that we actually believe in these theories that have never been proven ever? Uh, so, I mean, go one step beyond the, the most apparent problem. 
uh, yeah, and then my, my last reflection, which is also a question. So there has been a movement now, I think, of, of researchers and also students, uh, you know, general people, to give up on leadership. Uh, they say the last 10 years have proven, or 20 years, that you know, political leadership can't do anything about this. So what we have to do is to change our individual lives. Uh, and I, I just want to hear your comments on that, because you're, you're talking about leadership, but you're also you know, putting the mirror back to all of us sitting here, like, well, it's you have to start. Um, so shall we give up on political leadership? Thank you, Marika. Okay, um, starting by acknowledging Per Espen, of course, uh, and, and I think uh, Norway and Sweden are doing particularly bad in solar. I think Sweden is in, in place 34 in installed uh, PV panels of all the countries in the world, and, and Norway is 35, and there's only Finland uh, below us, I think, or is if Norway and Finland is, is the same. But but I would still like to, to acknowledge that there, there is, of course, an opportunity. Here Here is an opportunity for solar in, in many of the world uh, countries today, and, and that's something that, that can, of course, lead to also to business opportunities. Uh, but taking the, the example of, of solar as well, uh, what really helped building this tremendous uh, decrease in prices for solar and, and enabling the Chile plant to be so low in cost was the individual initiative. Uh, it was uh, the individual people in the houses uh, in Germany uh, that installed PV on their houses and increased demand for PV that helped doing this. But they couldn't have done this without the politicians. Uh, so, so I think to be fast, to be rapid, you need to encourage the people to do it. It has to, that's the, the, the common ground here, I think, that it has to come from below. It cannot come only from above. But the, the role for the people above is to facilitate this change and not work against it. And I think that's, to some extent, also based on ignorance. They don't know that they are, are working against it. Uh, if they knew, maybe they would have acted differently. One example is a tax on PV, which is now discussed uh, in, in Sweden, and it says that if you're going to put uh, PV electricity on the net, you need to pay a tax because you're producing electricity, and every plant who's producing electricity has to pay tax. So even if you're self-consuming all of your electricity, you need to pay tax for the, for the electricity you're generating, which is stupid. But I think that's, that tax is based on ignorance. So how do we work against public ignorance to facilitate the change in people's minds and to facilitate the, the climate change? That's, uh, I think, a, 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 an important question. Thank you. Great. Thank you to the panelists for those first reflections. My process here, I think, is going to turn it to Kevin to, to do some answering of questions. and. And in the meantime, maybe those people who are helping with collecting of questions from the audience can deliver some to me. But Kevin. Well, I think these questions are quite, well, not they're quite, they're very deep and engaging and really need to, quite a few features or in, you come from Britain, quite a few nights in the pub to, <laughs> to really do them justice. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. Sorry, did, could you hear that? Okay, fine. Um, right, I'm going to go one by one. I'm going to try and be as quick as I reasonably can here. Um, I would argue the difference between what I'm suggesting and limits to growth is fundamental. They were talking about resources. I'm talking about sinks. So it's a difference between sources and sinks. And the reason I say that is because we can substitute for resources. We can use fiber optics instead of copper. We cannot substitute for the atmosphere. We cannot substitute for the carbon budget not in the time frames that we have to deal with things. I would also argue there's a very, in my view, and maybe I've mentioned it, maybe later we can discuss this, I think there's a huge inconsistency in what you're saying. You really do not like the concept of exponential growth that's wrapped up into limits for growth. That's what you made that point, that you thought was a mistake. But you welcomed it when it came to solar. So, I, you know, I, I would argue that is a, quite a strong inconsistency in those positions. 
um, that we need to reflect on. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe interpretation is wrong. But um, I think we need to reflect on and come back to say we, we have to hold to the integrity of the arguments, not necessarily choose the ones that give us justification for the positions we hold before we think of the arguments. And I think most of the time in academia, that's what we do. We post hoc, and economics does this all the time, we post hoc justify a position that we held before. We try to legitimize our prejudice. Um, also, you refer quite often to solve the problem, um, respond to the crisis. Um, I always try to be quite precise here. I'm not saying necessarily even that two degrees C is the problem. I'm saying what the climate change community, what the, sorry, what the international community has laid down in Paris, what civil society through the messy processes that it has, has come up with. And I see my job as an academic is to respond to that. So I will then sketch out that challenge as accurately as I can and then say, well, what are the responses to that? So I think you cannot just have, I'm not saying you're saying this necessarily, but there's often people have a very nebulous framing of climate change without being thoroughly thinking it through. We'll do something about climate change. I'm working on climate change. Yeah. What, what do you mean by climate change? What are you working towards? I think that is sketching the problem is pivotal and that we in the academic community have not done that and have not used it consistently throughout. Um, when it comes to analog, well, probably I think there wasn't a lot I disagreed with that. I like the idea that um, a belief in irreconcilable things. I mean, I think some things we can't hold in the next 15 minutes to a, a 0.3 degree C temperature rise compared to industrial revolution because we're at one degree now. That's irreconcilable. We've lost that opportunity. My concern is that we are, every day that we fail and every day we are failing, then we are putting more, making more things irreconcilable. So I do, I do think it is important to say that you, know, you can't have your cake and eat it. There are some things that cannot be brought together. You have to make that choice. Um, the problem is not economic growth. Um, no, I don't think the problem is economic growth, but it, it's, it's how that has dominated the world that has served the elites like us remarkably well. And, and we are so reluctant to let go of it now. And that we have buttressed it theoretically. We have developed whole university departments. It dominates our governments. We use it for assessing the quality of university research, of our policing systems, of our education systems. We use that sort of same framework of quantification that underpins um, neoclassical economics for every, almost every facet of society. So it's, it's more the, the broad thread of that framework that is permeated everywhere in society that I'm, I'm trying to question here, not just the narrow definition of economic growth. And I would argue that it's not necessarily an economic theory behind it. Um, if, you, if you work in physics, you would never dream of using Newtonian physics to understand quantum mechanics. It doesn't stop the economists using marginal economics. Marginal economics is looking at small change to address issues that are systemic. I mean, Surely academics can't be doing that. I mean, it seems to me that it's odd that we're carrying on with that. Um, so I think we do have to question economic theory um, and ask you really, actually, is it a theory or is it, is it something that's a post hoc justification again for something that we like the results of? And leadership, I think, is really pivotal. Um, I haven't given up on political leadership, but I do not see leadership, I do not see political leadership as people out there. We are political leaders. We are the thought makers in our society and universities. I don't like the idea of top-down or bottom-up. I see the world as a much more complex, messy place. I don't see a difference, this is a definite public discussion, between the individual and the collective. I don't think individuals actually exist. I don't think we really live and die. We live in a quasi-immortal um, society, and we have to recognize our role within that as part of a system. But the reductionist approach we use in universities to under, under explain these things is we see the individual or we see the collective. And I think that is sometimes helpful and other times is problematic. So I see leadership being within, and not just in universities, but within all of us. I do not see leadership that is imposed from above. But actually, leadership and governments do need examples. They need universities to lead by example. If all universities start to say how important this is at a global level, it'd be very hard for, for governments to start to ignore what was coming out of universities. But instead, universities are being run like businesses and are doing exactly the same as governments are trying to do. We're all trying to attract more international students. We're trying to expand. We're building more, more buildings. We're claiming to be more, be more efficient, but overall, our footprint goes up. So, and leadership occurs at every level. Um, and actually, I think we had, we had lots of agreements, I think. <laughs> um, except for one important one. Okay. And that was this idea of ignorance. 
Uh, firstly, I'm not sure that that many policymakers are ignorant, uh, to some degree anyway. I think they actually are aware of lot what's there, but they feel they have a whole suite of other pressures. It's easy for us as academics. We just deal with climate change. They've got pensions to deal with, welfare, immigration, you know, everything. You know, they're trying to put all of that together and make some sense of it. It's a really challenging job being a politician, and I think we should give them credit for trying to do it, even if we think most of the time that they may fail. But actually beyond that, I think, look at ourselves. The climate change community cannot claim ignorance about climate change. We are the most informed group there is about climate change, and we, we have let our emissions rocket, skyrocket. We have not demonstrated any leadership, despite complete level of knowledge. So I'm not sure what's called the deficit model is an accurate description of our inaction. I think there is something much more deeply rooted and cultural in why it is we, we are choosing not to act. When, as I tried to point out, there are a whole suite of things that we can be doing. And indeed, across the panel, we've pointed out there are a whole suite of opportunities to make change now. At the moment, I'd argue all we're doing is we're adding those changes on top of the existing system. You know, we're not substituting, we're complementing. So, I'll finish there. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Gave me some time to look at some very excellent questions. I have questions from the audience. I don't know if Daniel is here and has the questions that he's um, harvesting from our Twitter hashtag, but um, we'll add those questions to the pile. And sorry, I'm not going to get to all of the questions. Um, I thought I would start with one question, which is uh, because Kevin, you you alluded to this many times in your talk, and I have to say that I'm one of the those climate elites who jumps on a plane a lot. I got here by plane. But somebody wants to know, um, well, generally, how do you personally change your life to a more sustainable one? How would the ideal climate change friendly life look like? But then very specifically, did you, for example, stop taking the plane? Well, uh, the last was easy. I stopped flying in 2004 because of climate change. Um, and it's not, it's not been easy for a number of reasons. Um, for various reasons, my, a lot of my family died quite early, but I have an uncle who's still alive in Australia. I will never see him again. Mm. So I have to recognize I've not seen him since 2004, and he will die and I will never see him. That's not easy. Um, I went to China recently, I also went to uh, Iceland. I tried to, I tried to travel much less, and you have to travel by other modes, by container ships or by trains. You have to plan that one in advance. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to do. But the other thing you have to do is you have to recognize that when you go, you go for longer because you're not going to go back for a long time. That has big family repercussions in terms of your networks of friends at home. But all of this has family repercussions. Often people, I hear lots of my colleagues say, I, think I have to fly back because I've got my family. Yeah, but by flying, flying back, you're wiping out someone else's family. The emissions from that are damaged. So you're privileging your family over that of a family that's to be more impoverished than yours anyway and to suffer the repercussions of the flight back. So there is not a no family option here. So I, I'm left in the end. I cannot see, if I work on climate change, how I can continue with the most profligate, uh, next to Formula One racing car driving, the most profligate activity in terms of emissions. But the biggest problem with it as well is that we are, it's not the individual emissions, it's that we are locking in a system for which, even if we do do something about aviation, we will not reduce the emissions from aviation within a 10 to 15 year time frame. Be because it just takes that long to get the fuels tested for a start. You cannot change the infrastructure on planes. You can't come up with a new plane design because it's got the land at the infrastructure at the other end. So you have to change the infrastructure at a global level very rapidly indeed. So aviation is one of the problems that we cannot resolve within a reasonable time frame. We will be able to resolve it in the long run. And, during, and I can't be part of the system that locks that in. China's got 150 new international airports being built. If they want to fly like the UK flies, they need another 400 international airports. So we are locking in a high carbon activity there. But also beyond that, I think it's much more important. If you fly, you generally use taxes. If you use taxes, then you're relatively elite, you live in big houses. It supports that whole structure. There is something about that sort of activity, activity that is emblematic um, of how people like us are living our lives, that is very high carbon. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you have to make the very difficult choice of trying to do it much less than we do now. And structurally, that should be supported by our universities, by our colleagues. And at the moment, it's not. You're ridiculed if you don't fly. And you're penalized by the academic community um, and, you know, and by your own colleagues. Yeah. Pierre Espen, how do you take uh, uh, this sort of uh, suggestion that we don't fly 
um, and turn it into something that actually sounds like a positive contribution. Because for many of us, the thinking about not flying sounds like such a deprivation, and this is not a world that we want to live in when we can't fly. Oh, that's easy. Um, I admire anybody like Kevin who takes individual action and speaks public about it in terms of not flying. However, I think it contributes to painting climate leadership into a corner that nobody wants to join of extremists and goddamn tree huggers and environmental greenies that are weirdos. Uh, so what we should do in addition to all that is uh, position aviation as part of the solution. So how can we make aviation a carbon negative industry? Uh, and the solutions to this are quite easy. First of all, you can have tremendous improvement in the airline industry in terms of energy efficiency. You could substitute taxiing with electric motors. But finally, what you should do is include aviation within the European trading scheme system. So what I do personally is that when I fly, I pay four times the amount of carbon emissions from the European trading system. I take carbon emissions from a coal plant and I rip them up so they're never used. The more I fly, the less emissions from the European trade system. Um, these are structural political solutions that can be easily combined with technological solutions. And if you push this further enough, aviation could be a prime engine for bringing down uh, global emissions. That's where I would like to position this in a positive, opportunistic way with a multiple sense of that word. Could Thanks. Very quickly, back on very um, quickly, because I've got one more question just, that I'm going to try to get to. Gas turbines that drive these planes, they're beautiful bits of engineering that you will not get more efficiency out of them in the short term, more than about half to 1% per annum. And um, so you're constrained by laws of thermodynamics. The emission trading scheme is a supply. Well, I, 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 as an engineer, I work regularly with Rolls Royce on this. The, in, in the short term, the emissions trading scheme is oversupplied with credits, so you're not taking anything out of the system at all. So you're we just, need to we need to vacating the system. So okay, we need to that's that that withdraw the excess. We can't we can't do a back and forth here. I've okay. got another question. Yeah. I've got one more question. Uh, I think that'll take us up to our time, um, and or maybe we can fit in a further one. We'll see. Uh, Kevin, you, put, you presented a lot of data in your PowerPoint. Um, no more coal, no more oil, no more gas. 80% has to stay in the ground. Um, we know this term of stranded assets, right? There's a lot of investment still in fossil fuels. Um, and what, what is the role of divestment in fossil fuels in the transition that you're trying to get us to? Um. We've just been going through that in Manchester University. Um, we've just written a report. Um, a group of people have very different views for the governors of the university. So we're trying to decide whether we should divest or not. Um, I came on, down on one particular side of it. Geologists who were funded by the fossil fuel companies came down on the other side of it. So we had different views on this. Um, my view of divestment is that actually the amount of money is not what matters. In fact, a lot of our universities divested mostly from fossil fuels already because they're not giving good returns. But the important thing um, is that it is symbolic, it's emblematic. The thought leaders of our society, which is still what, you know, that's what our job is in university, have analyzed the information and think it is no longer pro appropriate to be invested in fossil fuels. That is what is important. It is not the amount of money. And the great thing about once you get universities doing that, once you start to break the dam and more universities do it, what that will drive, and already we're starting to see that in some parts of the UK, that will drive the pension industry. When the pension industry start to move out of it, mm. you know, that will be the beginning of the end of the oil industry. Um, but whether we can do that in the time frame we have for two degrees C, or not, I'm not sure. So I think um, you know, divestment is a pivotal message from the thought leaders of our society that we are not climate skeptics. So that would be my take on it. Thank you. Does anyone else on the panel want to add? OK, Pear. Very constructive on top of that. Divestment and then reinvest in green bonds. Green bonds is a huge financial innovation that is struck, that is helping. Um, because if you just buy shares in, in other greener companies, the, that, those, that money is not available for their reinvestment. But green bonds are allocated for new low, low and zero carbon uh, infrastructural changes. So divestment by itself doesn't make much sense if you just reinvest, but divestment plus reinvestment in green bonds really makes a big deal. Marika or Anneli, anything to, to contribute? Okay, yeah. Um, there have been a 
couple of questions about um, nuclear energy. Kevin, your dad worked in nuclear power. You showed the plant where, where he worked. I wonder if you wanted to comment on nuclear in, in, in the energy mix of the currently or in the future. Okay, uh, very quickly, boring set of numbers. I am ag relatively ag agnostic about nuclear. It is low carbon. It's probably five to 15 grams per kilowatt hour as a life cycle emission, so it's, it's down there with the renewables. Nuclear provides 2.5% of global energy demand, final global energy demand, final, not primary, 2.5%. Um, that comes from about, I've got to remember the numbers now, 420 power stations at a global level, something like that. If you wanted it to make a significant dent, you'd probably have to build about another you know, two to 4,000 nuclear power stations in the next 20 to 30 years for it to really make a dent in relation to the sorts of temperatures we're talking about here. Um, so you just come to a, state, a, a quite clear point, you cannot build them fast enough. That's mm -hmm. not to say they haven't got a role to play, they may have in some parts of the world. Um, but nevertheless, you cannot build them fast enough. There are also questions about, is there enough uranium-235 out there? The, the, the jury is split on that. Some nuclear advocates say there's plenty, others say there's not very much. Um, other people say you can use fast breeder reactors, which have been designed and have worked in the UK and in France and one or two other places. Um, a normal nuclear reactor cannot explode with a nuclear explosion. It does not have enough material to go critical. It can go dirty, like Chernobyl, but it can't go critical. The problem with a fast breeder reactor, it has enough material to go critical. And I think you'd have some planning problems. We have planning problems with nuclear now. If people actually were aware, it could have enough material to go bang. That would be a problem. The other problem with nuclear, with um, fast breeders, is the concentration of the material you use, the uranium or the plutonium that you use, is, a is bordering on a weapons grade. It's not for a normal reactor. So you know, stealing uranium, uranium from a normal reactor will not allow you to make a bomb, a nuclear bomb. It would allow you to make it. So if, if there were thousands of fast breeders and lots of material floating around, that is a real proliferation issue in terms of um, access to nuclear materials. Um, but it may have a role to play in some places, but I would argue it is always ahead of the fossil fuels and always behind the renewables and efficiency. Thanks. Well, um, maybe one last question, and as when you have lots of great questions, it's always hard to decide between them. But um, maybe to, to just reflect a little bit on the importance of, of influential people, influential people as the, the questioner asks the Pope when the Pope wrote Laudato, Laudato Si um, last year, or really influential, his encyclical on climate change, or the Dalai Lama, or I might say, you know, Nicholas Enstrom sitting sitting in the front. What's the role of the importance of, of those important um, people uh, to change how people think, to bring about system change? But you also might reflect on the role of not so visible people and, and our own roles. And maybe that's, how about if that's a question that I leave with the panel? Um, to, if we can get everybody to, to give some final comments. Marika? Yeah. I think an important role with influential people is that they have the politicians' ears. Uh, so, so if we can talk to you and, and uh, people will listen to you, I, I think that, that's a very important role of, of influential people. Also, the, the, the people you showed on the graph, which were, were among us as, as uh, not so good at, at, at climate change, but, but still they give their faces and people listen to them. So if we can get them to say wise things and maybe also act more wisely and we can act more wisely, I think that that's also good. Yeah. So I completely agree also with Kevin in terms of the climate crisis is really a crisis of the imagination. It is um, a, a failing capacity to see ourselves in relationship to nature in a much more plural way than with the one we've had from modernity. So I think influential people should strengthen the alternative narratives in our culture. And for my and stuff, research and analysis, there are four main of these. One is uh, the green growth narrative, that's genuine green growth and not just greenwashing. How, what is that difference? Another one that hasn't been mentioned is the quality of life story. How do we increase people's happiness without depending on increased material consumption? Because from, we know from psychology science there is no correlation between material consumption and happiness, uh, in, at least in, in, in uh, the richer part of the, of the world. Thirdly, uh, there's a beautiful resurgence within religion 
and uh, the greening of religion led by the Pope and Buddhism and uh, even uh, Islamic scholars are bringing out uh, the ethics of uh, our relationships to the creation and also future generations, the ethics part of that. And finally, I love the rewilding narratives where we see ourselves as somebody who goes along and, and helps wisely stimulate the biodiversity and helps the resilience of ecosystems rather than continuing to pushing them towards the brink. And it's happening a lot of places in Europe and elsewhere where we find out how extremely beneficial it is when our cities can work alongside with the ecosystem, strengthening them, rewilding them rather than zapping them. So thanks. Four main narratives. Anneli? Uh, yeah, I, I think by just providing opportunities to bring these discussions on the table is, is an, a very important, by, by providing this forum that we're now having, it is one example of how influential people can influence. Uh, but I think all of us are influential people uh, because if you look at periods in history when there has been a big change, it hasn't been that one person or leader. It has been many people making a change. So, but, thanks. Kevin? I've never met an unimportant person. <laughs> Shall I do a question? <laughs> uh -huh. And I would also go slightly further than that. I don't know what we mean by influential. If we take a reductionist model, we think we can identify who is influential. We are in a society now that is complex, not just complicated, but complex. You cannot identify who is influential in a complex system. So everyone has the potential to be influential. A prime minister is ne not necessarily any more influential than a school child. We just don't know how the system works. The system is complex, and that is difficult for us to have spent years and years working with reductionism. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> working with reductionism. Um, to really accept. Um, the, and I want to just finish off with an example. Mary Manning, I use the example quite often now, Mary Manning uh, was a cashier, a lowly cashier is probably how we would describe them in our current system in the UK, at an Irish store called Dunn Store, a big store in, in Southern Ireland. And she refused to put apartheid goods, for those of you who can't remember that period, and that was when you know, South Africa split up between you know, broadly the blacks and the whites, and the blacks had very little, as anything really changed. Um, so there was an apartheid scheme. She refused to put apartheid goods through her cashier, through the till, and she was sacked because she was just a cashier. So she got together with some friends, and that is really important, to have friends and colleagues who will support you. And she started to campaign outside with big placards. Within six months, Dunn's no longer stocked apartheid goods. Within two years, Ireland no longer imported any goods from South Africa. That was a cashier, a lowly cashier, who made a fundamental change to the way that Ireland worked. So any of us has a chance to bring about system change. Yeah, we're all important, we're all influential. Thank you. Thank you, and on that note, can, can I ask you to join me in thanking the entire panel? And can you? Can you keep cl clapping for our excellent moderator, uh, Doreen Stavinsky? <laughs> to conclude this event, I would just like to say thank you as well to everyone who came here um, and also say that we look forward to continued conversation and debate uh, along these lines and these issues that we're bringing up here today. So this is something that we'll hopefully be able to build upon uh, in, the, in the year that you're here or, or more that you're here, Kevin. And we're very much looking forward to keeping in touch with you, Doreen, as well, of course. I'd like to, before people start uh, moving around and so forth, I'd just like to bring your attention to that this was, of course, an event that was quite a, a performance in some ways. There was some interaction. Uh, but also on the last note of this uh, idea that everybody can be a part of this, uh, uh, this huge challenge that we're facing in climate change, uh, we would like to invite everybody here uh, to a workshop uh, next Monday. And this is an afternoon workshop between 3 and 5, where we will have much more of an interactive conversation with uh, Kevin and uh, some of the other researchers that we've been working on for the last year, but also students uh, in a new course, which. Uh, Professor Eva Okeson, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, in your speech also, climate change leadership and practice. Some of you are probably in this room. 
So we'll continue this conversation on Monday between 3 and 5 in something called the Uppsala Learning Lab, which is a very interesting and innovative space, a little bit that way. Uh, so check out our website uh, to, uh, to see the details and make sure to register. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you, everybody, for coming, and also those of you who weren't able to fit into this uh, small room. Uh, we really tried to get a big lecture hall, so thank you also for watching from the Earth Sciences Library, those of you watching uh, online, and also those of you watching from other parts of the world. So, um, let's go have lunch. <laughs>